Hey, good afternoon. Nice. So, hopefully, I've been outside, get a little exercise, some fresh air. Um, so, thanks again for joining us for another town hall meeting. Um, I think, as everybody knows by now, we do these every Wednesday at two o'clock. Give everybody an up, give everybody an update on what we have going on currently, and a recap of some stuff from the previous week and some things that we have coming up in the um, upcoming week. So. Um, as always, we'll send out a recap email that Holly does for us and uh, make sure that you'll have it, both a hard copy in your mailbox and an uh, email version if we have your email address. And then all family members and staff will get the same info so everybody's on the same page. So um, that's continuing to work well, I think. And uh, we had a lot of questions last week, which is really beneficial. Um, I hope that has helped a lot of people I actually shared our format with another community. Um, they were talking, they don't have an in-house TV channel like we do, but they're going to start doing small group meetings of 25 outside with the executive director because they don't have a way of getting this information across and let residents ask questions. So I sent um, a lady who's a good friend of mine a copy of our um, recap memo and how we do our questions and answers, and she found it very helpful. So glad we could help them. There's a community up in um, Arden, North Carolina, or outside of Asheville. So, so hopefully that will work well for her. I'm just thankful that we have this system and can um, come to you every week and give you updates, and y'all can call in and ask questions. I think it's worked very well. So we'll jump into some stuff. I thought I'd just do some quick highlights from today, and y'all may be on this more than me, but it looks like we had another um, statewide, I'm talking about just North Carolina updates, another record day of um, hospital admissions uh, with COVID um, with COVID patients, um, 994. So again, that's another state record. Um, currently 1,144 deaths related to COVID and just under a million tests administered statewide. So under a million tests administered. And then uh, and throughout the whole U.S., we have now over 3 million positive cases. So um, it's not going in the right direction. Uh, Mandy Cohen said again today that the numbers are trending in the wrong direction. I know that we're still trying to figure out when, when and how schools will go back and what order what time frame, um, you know, will things shut back down? Will we continue to slowly open things, not open things? But um, unfortunately, it's, it's just not good right now. So as far as it is statewide. So again, I think, again, just to preface this again, I think the numbers just really correlate with what is going on here. And I think you'll see that more in other communities as time goes on. Um, you know, went a long time without any cases, and it's just inevitable it's going to happen. So once... Um, other communities start doing testing, which it doesn't matter who has the most or if they have any or none. I'm just worried about spring more. So, um, but I think you'll see more and more of that pop up as tests come about. I'm just glad we're ahead of the curve on that and can start uh, addressing the cases that we know about. So to jump into that, currently right now, um, we have 18 total active cases. That's residents and employees, 18 total active cases. 10 are staff members. Um, Six staff members that work in the Stewart Health Center and four that work in supportive living. Uh, we have currently eight residents, and they're half and half, four in the Stewart Health Center and four in supportive living. Now, that doesn't mean that the ones in supportive living are actually in supportive living. I think perhaps all of them are either in the health center or in another location. So, um, But as far as active cases, four Stewart Health Center residents and four supportive living residents. Um, we have administered a total, as far as we can tell right now, the best number, and this changes so much, it's hard to keep up with, administered 382 tests. Um, that is up from 59 of week over week. We had had um, 323 tests last week. So, again, we conducted over 59 more tests um, week over week for a total of 382. Um, where we were last week at this time, we had 15 total cases. But a uh, different case mix. So it was interesting to see all the staff members were in the health center, and there were a total of eight. So you can see how we have um, people coming off and reducing in health center from where we were last week. But then we've added in supportive living um, this week four. And um, last week we had seven total residents, and they were all in the health center to where this week we have eight, one more, and half in the health center and half in support of living. So that's where we are um, week over week, current. And then last week, 
um, again, kind of what led us to the support of living and how we got into that mix was we did mass testing last week on all support of living residents and the staff members that work down there. That includes all the um, nurses and the CNAs, uh, in addition to the housekeepers and the home care workers and also in um, anyway that works in dining services down there. So that's where they were, um, where they produced some positive tests for staff and for residents. But the quicker we identify them, the quicker we can treat them and get them better. Um, I know that all the um, employees are doing well, and currently all the residents are doing well. Um, so that is very good news to report. I'm very glad of that, and they're all expected to recover fine, hopefully, and, and get back to supportive living. But again, that was uh, that was due to uh, one resident, um, excuse me, one employee testing positive, and we did um, as she developed symptoms. So we learned um, from doing the mass testing last time at the health center. We started off as one one employee had it, and then we contact traced them to um, to the to the residents that she ser um, served, and we um, tested 16 of them, and then staff members, and we tested all of them, and then we contact traced them, and then we ended up testing everybody. So in reality, we ended up doing three large amount of tests, um, and we finally got everybody. So once the one staff member tested positive, and then we had one resident showing symptoms, um, we thought that it was best just to go ahead and mass test everybody. There's not a lot of, there's not as many residents there, obviously 35, and then not near as many staff. So we was able to knock all that out in an hour, and it gave us a good baseline. I think uh, looking back, that was a, I think I, uh, that was a good decision on our part, I, I think, in support of living to just do all the tests because uh, we would end up doing it anyway because, as you can see, it produced more more positive results and we'd have just contact traced it and got some there and some there. So anyway, we knocked them all out and that's where we're at. So again, the quicker we know, the quicker we can get them help and get them feeling better. So um, um, so they are getting um, the daily checks and wellness um, checks just like the residents in the health center are. Um, again, it depends on if someone is isolated in their room in supportive living or if we would get a case in independent living versus a health center. If you can be cared for within your residence in supportive living or in your independent living apartment, we'll quarantine you there. You're already in a private room, which is great. Um, there's no need to move to the health center to take up another bed and take you down the hall and get you in the health center. Um, but there may be a point to where you need to have more frequent care by a nurse. So then that is the then, then the nurse will determine should we temporarily move you to the health center in the isolation wing so you can be more cared for there 24 hours a day and more oversight. So it's going to depend on a case by case basis based on your symptoms and based on how you're reacting if you would happen to get the virus. So just keep that in mind that um, that you may be quarantined and cared for in your room or you may move to the health center. That's the same thing we have right now in supportive living. Um, so that is all the updates for the cases. Um, I think um, the, the chart is being updated daily on the portal. I know it's accurate today. I know we're putting one on the bulletin board. Um, those are put out every day by Joan, who works in uh, the health center. So when she puts up the hospital list, she puts up the chart. So she's going to put the, up the most accurate one she has. So just be just be mindful that you know she puts it up once a day, and we update the portal once a day as quick as we can. But things change fast, so just just please be mindful it's not may not be 100 percent accurate every second of the day but we update it just as fast as we can it's a lot of moving parts and a lot of moving things and when to report and who all and what area and who's going to put it up it's it seems easy and it's a very easy task but getting the correct numbers and getting that information is is a little more complicated than it seems just based on everything that we're having to deal with and making sure everything's accurate and the reporting that margo has to do on top of that to the local health department so just keep that in mind, but I hope that's helpful. I've heard good compliments on that. I had a phone call today from a resident uh, who left me a message saying that that was helping at the um, at the bulletin board. Uh, my goal, as since I've been here and will be until I'm not here anymore, which I hope is a very long time, that to be as transparent as possible. There's nothing to hide about this. There's nothing to be ashamed of, and we're telling you everything we have, and we're giving you each case and where they're at. Uh, we're not giving specific names because that's a uh, that's HIPAA unless it's, unless you're needed to know. Um, 
I'm not naive to not know that you guys will find out probably quicker than I will who the people are, and, and that's fine. There's nothing I can do about that. But uh, but we are putting this stuff up as fast as we can, and we're being as transparent as possible and even putting in the exact department that the staff member or, or the resident lives in. So I hope you all find that beneficial. So we'll move on to some updates. Um, as far as pathways, um, spiritual wellness, there's, there's a lot going on there. That continues to be very popular. Read uh, four announcements from them. Um, so today at 3.30, shortly after this, uh, we will begin our nine-week discussion and study called Vital Conversations, discussion on race and becoming, belo- becoming a beloved community here in the auditorium. Please email Juliana. Please call or email Juliana or Lori if you'd like to sign up to participate, and please wear your mask. So this is a great, um, I think the, uh, the title of this, Vital Conversations, is just a perfect title for discussion group on race and becoming a beloved community at this time. I think it's a very vital conversation <laughs> that we have to have and, and we need to have, and I'm so glad that the chaplains are going to be leading that in a very, in a very, I don't unbiased way. I guess that's the best way to put it. They do everything, and I learned a new word when when Juliana started ecumenical. Am I saying that right? Ec- ecumenical. So I guess that's not based on one religion. It's that we're all different types of religion. Is that right? Different Christian beliefs. Yeah, so uh, so that's uh so they're going to approach it from that aspect, which is great. Um, so I, I think that's very neat that they're doing that, and I couldn't ask for two better people to do that. I will brag on Lori and uh, Juliana for a second. I don't know the details, but I volunteered them to do a presentation at our Leading Age Fall Conference. Um, they've had a phone call about what they're going to go over. I don't even know what it is, but um, I volunteered them, and our uh, director of education for Leading Age was quick to jump on that. So they're going to be doing a, a pretty cool presentation um, in, I believe, in September, October, um, of um, through, through Leading Age. And uh, we'll tell you more about that, but they we couldn't ask for two better chaplains to be here working and helping our residents. Um, Tomorrow at 1030, um, we'll have our next Zoom call discussion. Um, You can call or email Juliana if you're not able to, if you're not on the email list and you'd like to participate. So please call her. Um, But it's tomorrow at 1030, so make sure you do that sometime today or first thing in the morning. Um, If you'd like to attend Vespers in person, please call or email Juliana or Lori. We can have up to nine people present in the congregation. Juliana is teaching or teaching preaching this Sunday, and we'll, of course, continue to stream live on um, Spring War 1341. So we're continuing to follow that 10-person rule, uh, nine and the other extra being the uh, the Vesper person, which will be Juliana this week. So if you'd like to come, please come. We have appropriately spread out here in the auditorium so you can feel safe while you're in here worshiping. And lastly, our final Bible study on faith and fear will be this coming Tuesday, June 14th at 3 p.m., and that's going to be on Spring War 1341 as well. So a lot of good spiritual life stuff going on and spiritual wellness during this time, which is, whew, I think, needed more than ever now. So a lot of good stuff to take advantage of. Um, Resident Life has got a lot of good announcements, so um, just bear with me here. I'm going to read about six or seven points. Um, Leah wanted me to make sure everyone knows our art classes um, are now canceled for July, and this was out of concern for the instructors as well as the residents due to the close proximity of the instructors and in the room. So, so they've canceled the art classes for the month. Hope to get those back soon, but that was a decision that was made um, on, uh, again, the instructors and the residents in Leah's part, and I think that's very important for people to have autonomy to make those decisions to cancel stuff based on uh, kind of the way they're feeling and the feedback from the residents. So that's going to stop for now. And a few things about the mail. Um, if you need help, if we need your help with social distancing. If the mail is being distributed, please do not attempt to retrieve your mail for the volunteers for the volunteer safety as well as your own. Please come back at another time. So if you see them putting it up, just wait and come back, and it'll die down like a line at a grocery store or anywhere else. And you can come back and get it another time, but when it's so many people come back, compact in there, you're not able to practice the required social distancing. So keep that in mind. If you get someone else's mail, and I'm sorry that's going to happen, even if the postman brings it here, um, sometimes it's not always the right address. So if you do get the wrong um, mail, please give it to Leah 
are one of the male coordinators, Mr. Fuller in North Village and Mr. Waters in South Village, and we'll make sure the mail gets to the intended owner. The volunteers make every effort to avoid mistakes with their wearing gloves and things stick together with such a large number of items. Also, the mail is distributed by number. If you get a previous accountant's mail address, if you get a previous accountant's mail, address change do not reach addresses do not reach every company so please give it us to Ford so basically just just if you get someone else's mail um, you know th we're doing the best we can with it it's it's, a, it's it's the best system we have we're extremely blessed to have volunteers who are so dedicated to do this every day I have heard horror stories from I believe it's another community in the triangle that said um, when they had a positive case, they literally wouldn't even bring it to the community, not even outside. They had to have someone literally go to the post office, pick up the mass mail, and then distribute it to all the residents. So um, seems a bit overkill to me, but that happened to another facility here in the Triangle. They wouldn't even drop it off outside to the to the community. So let's be very thankful that we are getting the mail. We have dedicated volunteers to help us with that. Um, in North Village, please check the large package table for items so we have room for new items. Please do not take packages from the table if they're not yours. For North and South, packages not coming from UPS such as FedEx, Amazon, and UPS, they'll be delivered to your door by the security guards. So hang tight on those. They'll, they'll get them up to you. If you are going away, please contact the post office to have your mail held during this time. We don't have room to store your mail. That is a good practice to do. Um, I think we talked about that last time. You know, you go on vacation, you know, have your mail just held at the post office, and then when it comes back, um, we do have limited space out there, and we're working with the best we have. So just be mindful to stop your mail if you're out of town. If you're quarantined to your apartment, your mail will be delivered to your door. So when we any anytime somebody is quarantined, um, we let Leah know, and Leah knows to get your mail to you. Jennifer knows to get your food to you, so you don't need to worry about that. If something would happen to fall through the cracks, just don't hesitate to call Leah, call Jennifer, call me. Um, but I think we've been pretty um, pretty successful in that throughout the fast five plus months going on. Um, and if you live in North Village, please check both locations for mail. The locked in-house mailbox by the post office and the filing system upstairs outside of Leah's office. The federal post office boxes are not being used at this time. So I think you guys know that, but just be mindful that it's only in-house mail and the federal boxes are not being used. We don't have a key to those. And in today, in, and lastly, in today's in-house mail, we're sending out a COVID-19 risk factor scale. The scale lets you know what level of risk you are at certain activities, such as grocery shopping or visiting with someone in your home. So it's a pretty neat chart. It gets from low to high, and it tells you if you're you know, moderate, severe risk uh, based on certain activities. So it's just a good way to practice social distance and make sure that you're wearing your mask. Um, that is that is so, so very important, making sure that you're wearing your mask at all times. I get calls from residents once in a while. Once in a while, I'll be in a couple of times a week about residents not seeing other residents wearing their mask. And I, I, I can't stress it enough to please wear your mask. I know some people are very um, confident in just saying, hey, you should have on your mask. You should be walking down the halls. You, you could get us infected. And some are a little too modest and shy and don't want to say that. And I, I get it. It's You don't have to. But I, you know, we can't police the halls 24-7. We got staff working the best we can. When one staff member's out, just remember it takes another staff member to do that job. And when there's multiple staff members out in different departments, it's a chain reaction. We have, we have one staff member doing multiple jobs. So having someone up and down the hall, um, I, I don't mean this in any snide way, but y'all are all... And we are all grown adults, so we have to rely on each other, being responsible to each other of not spreading the disease. That goes for myself. It's a 41-year-old man to someone twice my age that lives here versus somebody much younger. But we all are, are grown adults, and we have to just make sure that we're being responsible and just taking um, every precaution to keep everybody safe. So 
So just be mindful of that. Um, a couple of follow-ups I want to talk about. I had a, um, a resident call about the automatic doors um, being um, turned back on. I think perhaps it was under the impression that the doors were locked. Um, the automatic doors were never locked. We, we never went to that. We just turned the sensors off on the doors. So the residents and family members were still able to open and close the doors. It just wasn't electronically. We decided to turn the sensors back on. I think everybody knows we've done this for maybe a month now, at least 30 weeks, to just have the sensors turn back on. When we went to phase two and the stay-at-home order was um, was put in place, um, that allowed residents to leave more freely and do more essential business. So um, the fact that the doors could still be opened manually by by family members or by residents, I didn't think it made sense anymore to have the sensors turned off. So we turned them back on to make it easier for the residents. But again, I can't stress enough, like the mask, that we can absolutely have no visitors here with inside Springmore, um, except for the two common areas where you can uh, make reservations to see your family member in hour increments. That is in both North and South Village. You can call the front desk. You can set that up. You can visit outside, but no family members are allowed inside Springmore. Um, I don't know how long that's going to continue, but as things continue to uh, have active cases here and the things continue to rise throughout the state, I don't see that being lifted anytime soon. The good part is you can always leave and you can go see your family outside. You can go to their house. And some people may think, well, why can we do that? They, they can't come in. I can't stop you from going. Again, I've said this and nor would I ever want to, but I can control who comes in the building. So I can only control what I can control, and that's just one thing that I feel confident in trying to, um, trying to minimize is not having any family inside. So please, please be mindful of that. Um, last, a uh, couple of other things. Uh, one, one last thing, I had a resident uh, call and concern about staff kind of crossing over in work areas. Um, we do have different staff members that work in, <clears throat> not in different areas, but they have to walk down different halls. So if you have a caretaker or a housekeeper that works in supportive living and they have to walk down a hall, um, you know, that, that, that's going to happen from time to time. Um, we're doing the best we can. I'm going to be sending something out to everybody um, about, about not going in areas where you're not needed, uh, basically just going only to required areas. Like I've not been down to the kitchen or the great room or down a hall and I can't tell you when. It's been a couple of weeks. There's just no point or no sense in me going down anywhere other than my office and to the bathroom and to this auditorium. That's, that's about as, as far as I go. I go into the health center only when I have to. Um, so we're going to preach that to staff. But just be mindful that staff have to get in and they have to go around. You know, a staff member walking down the hall with a mask on, they're not going to, you know, you're not automatically just going to just get the coronavirus by them walking down the hall. So be mindful of that. I, I, you can never be too safe. I realize that. But, um, but, but we have to have essential people doing, continuing to care for people. And, um, and it does take time for, for someone to contact the coronavirus with the uh, amount of time in the proximity. So walking down a hall, um, you know, it, it, it could be a lot worse. We're going to do the best we can for that. But just please be mindful that it's, it's essential business, and, it, and, if, and if we can we have to continue to care for y'all, we have to do it in a certain way, and we're doing the best we can with that. So, so that's about all I had. Um, I'll be happy to take any calls. Is it 7054? Is that the number, I think? Brad, is that it? Yep, 7054. I don't know. I forgot that. So we got a call coming in here, so I'll be happy to answer anything. Um, hopefully we'll continue to see these cases drop and get people healthy again. But um, that's where we're at now, and we'll uh, we'll keep doing the best we can with it. Okay, so um, the question was, can I clarify why there were seven cases in the health center last week and there's only four now? Remember that chart is just active cases. So I'm just reporting active cases. 
Um, so there were currently last week seven active cases in the health center. Last week, currently there's just four. So I hope that explains it. It's just, it's just active cases. Seven last week, four right now. Yeah, that's because yeah that some that, that the reason that dropped is some people came off of, of isolation. So so once they are off their quarantine, they're they're off the list of, of active cases and they're and they're back to their room. Um, Fourteen days is the minimum they have to stay on isolation. <clears throat> some may stay longer based on our medical director, our nurse practitioner, our other doctor that's here. Um, um, so, so we, we use their advice, so they may stay on their 16 or 17 days if they continue to have symptoms, but um, 14 days is the minimum, but the three that dropped off, um, they have just gotten better and they're no longer need to be on the isolation. Uh, so the question is, if you're outside and you're social distancing, can you take your mask off? I, I don't know the expert answer on that, I would say yes. If I'm outside and I'm six feet apart from somebody, I, yeah, I would not wear my mask unless someone was uncomfortable. They asked me to put it on and I'd be happy to. But if I'm outside talking to our neighbor, I don't wear my mask. Um, if I was talking to a resident here and they felt uncomfortable again, I'd put it on. But I don't know the exact scientific answer to have it on outside. I think it's best practice to always have it on. I think it was just such a vulnerable population. Unfortunately, it is what it is. It's more, you know, so we're an older population here, and it's more vulnerable. So I think it's the best practice to 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 wear it at all times. Okay, so there were questions. There were uh, two questions about quarantine. Why are uh, the supportive living residents quarantined, and why is a group of independent residents quarantined? Uh, we did mass testing and supportive living, which I talked about earlier, and those produced um, positive cases in both the residents and staff. So we quarantined all supportive living as a safety measure, um, just as we did in the health center whenever we had positive tests. So that that's no different than when it was in the health center. So we got positive cases. So all this, all the uh, supportive living residents are being quarantined for 14 days. Um, and then there was a uh, there's a group of residents seven or eight that are quarantined now as a safety precaution. Um, there was uh, an employee that works within uh, it's a housekeeper that works within a part of independent living, and uh, they tested positive and they had possible exposure. So again, it's a safety practice. We we're quarantining those just as we did the very first case uh, back in I don't know when that was April or May. Uh, we had quarantined about 14 residents over in South Village. It's a housekeeper due to possible exposure. Nothing came of it, thank goodness. Uh, but again, that will be a 14-day um, quarantine for those residents. So again, it's just a safety procedure when anytime someone is possibly exposed to someone that's uh, tested positive. Uh, so the question is, if a resident tests positive, do they quarantine in their room in the health center? I think I mentioned that earlier. It depends on how your symptoms are and, and how you're reacting to the virus. If you are asymptomatic and you need minimal care and the clinic can care for you by checking you twice a day, uh, we'll care for you in your room and have all your mail and food dropped off and the clinic will come and check on you. If your symptoms are more to where you need um, a nurse every day and you need to be checked more on a regular basis, we'll move you to the health center. So that will be determined um, by uh, the physicians here and also by nursing staff. Uh, the question was, we had a death in the health center in the isolation unit, and they want to know if it was due to COVID. I have no idea of that. That will be the medical director and the medical examiners determine if COVID was the cause of the death. So, uh, again, not trying to hide anything. I do not look at death reports, so I have no idea. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, the question is, are we going to be opened in September or November for voting? And if not, can we get absentee ballots? I have no idea to that. Um, I have no idea if the polls are going to be open or not. If the polls are open, will they be open here? I don't know. I don't see we're an official polling precinct, but being that we're a vulnerable population and a community of 600 residents, we want people from, we only have a few people from the outside coming in, so maybe we would, um, I don't know how we would handle that, but I, again, I'm not sure that. I know I hate to put this back on Mr. Fuller, but I think he helps with that, and he's kind of the expert in some of the pol polling stuff. I wouldn't bomb him with, with questions, but he may be able to better answer that. I, I would absolutely assume, yes, we can get you absentee ballots. I don't know how that works. I don't know if we can necessarily do that for you, if you have to do that for yourself. You know, we can't call and get cable, act, you know, um, internet activated for you that's something you have to do on, on your own so that may be something you have to do on your own but i'm sure we can provide you information and help you any way possible if we don't have polling here in, in november okay all right so i think that's all the questions i wondered i wanted to say i, I forgot i wanted to just read you a quick a few things i read this interesting article today and i just wanted to just highlight a few things on here and thanks for all your questions by the way that those, those were really good and i hope that helps everybody when we we answer these um and then holly puts out a recap and um i hope that's very helpful so thank you all for calling in the questions they're they're very much appreciated by myself and i think by the staff and by the residents so they can kind of see what it, what y'all are thinking and have questions and answers that they may have so answers to questions they may have but interesting article that um i read today it was a survey conducted by the american senior housing association and it talked about people um their view of long-term care or retirement communities um during the pandemic and not surprising to me but hopefully not surprising to you either but it's pretty neat to see that um 61 percent of people um, had not changed their outlook or opinion about living in a retirement community during the pandemic so um so i thought that was positive to read 53 percent of the residents children have not changed their outlook of the mom or dad or loved one living in a um in a communal retirement setting uh, during the pandemic and interestingly enough this was 73 percent of adult children um, they um, they had no change of opinion for a loved one living in memory care. So um, I thought that was interesting. That had the highest one of memory care. Again, if you have a spouse or a loved one that has memory care um, issues, um, you know that's very hard to handle, and it may be impossible to handle. So um, having a setting like this is a blessing to many people. So it was like 73% of people thought that was still a very good thing and had not changed their opinion on that. Um, also, 50% of the uh, residents polled in this survey said one of the, the most essential thing was having a primary physician on site and access to telemedicine. You know, we're very lucky, and I think we forget, and I do too sometimes, until I start thinking about this one day, I'll have to deal with the fact that when Dr. Edmondson retires and having to replace him, which is not going to be um, tomorrow, but it's not going to be 10 years from now either. So I had to kind of give you a good indication of how long he's going to be around. <laughs> but um, you know, we're very lucky to have a medical director here that has dedicated us two days a week. Every Wednesday and Friday, our medical director is here. Um, in addition, we have Dr. Lang, who is practicing tele telemedicine. So he, um, he does not come in physically, but he does telemedicine. And then beyond all of that, we have a licensed nurse practitioner who's here five days a week. And I just think we for I forget, I hope you all don't forget, of how amazing that is for us to have here on site to have that access to physicians is is unbelievable to have their opinion in real time of when you isolate somebody do you move them to the health center do you keep them in your room do you keep them on the isolation unit more than 14 days um when someone is um in the isolation unit um i know for a fact um for a fact miss or will go and visit those people every day, and she'll call the families. And if someone's not doing well, she'll call the families. Um, so um, personally, and tell them that. So, so just having that attention of a licensed physician and nurse practitioner, two physicians, 
and being dedicated back there is just it's just absolutely amazing. So you can see that how it's just part of the pole. But I thought that was very interesting. You know that we are um, it's, it's we're in a communal living setting, and that's can be good and bad at times. Um, you know I you know here you know it is like your home and. I'm trying to think of a reason why you would technically have to leave the room if you didn't want to. Um, I guess technically you would have to get your mail, but other than that, you could have all your food delivered. Um, you could have pretty much anything delivered. Um, so it's it's really, I know that you that we live within a communal setting, but you know if you follow the same practices of the three W's of wear, wash, and wait, you know, you can be just as safe here as you can home or anywhere else. You can wait to get your mail. I mean, you have to wait to 7 o'clock and get it while nobody's up there, but you can still wait and get it. You know, yeah, we have to do that here. We have to wait to go to, I have to go to the grocery store. I have to wait in line. I have to, have to wash my hands. I got to wear my mask. It's no different than going down to the line to get your food. I mean, we all have to eat, so I have to go to the grocery store. So, I don't see a huge difference in that. I know we do provide services, and some of the staff members that provide the services do come in contact with the virus and unfortunately do spread it. Um, that is, um, that's one of the things that's, that's tough about communal living. But everybody's here for a reason. You know, either they, they, they need help or they want the care. or um, So you gotta, you got to look at the good with the bad with that. Um, it's, it's, it's just our setting. It's just, it's just really tough. And over, I think, half the deaths um, in the United States have been through um, nursing homes. So that's just a direct correlation of what you're seeing in the news and what some of the cases here. So um, I don't know. It's just a, it's just food for thought, but it's just it's just I want people to feel confident here. Um, you know, we provide meals for everybody. Um, housekeeping's never cleaned better than ever. I mean, everything's super clean, and everybody's wearing masks, and we have different ways of getting your food and different ways to provide you spiritual wellness and resident life and all those things that if you were home stuck by yourself, it may be even more depressing, even more lonely, and you may not be able to get out and get food and you may not be able to see a doctor or, or any of those things. So I think it's still the best place to be, <coughs> even though um, we have um, communities are having issues right now with um, the spreading of the virus that could still spread just as easy if you were living in a home and going out with anybody. I mean, I'm sure everybody knows somebody that has, has, has the coronavirus. My wife's got three cousins. They're all under 18. They all got it. And they live in a big house, and they're around young people, and they, you just get it. So, um, all right, enough of my soapbox on that. <laughs> I thought it was an interesting article, and I hope you all still feel confident about living here and hopefully still knowing that it's a, it's a good place to be. And hopefully your, your, um, your view hasn't changed. Remember, this will eventually go away. I don't know when, but, um, but it will go away when we find a vaccine. So, um, so it will be better days to come. So thanks again for tuning in. Um, for all the questions, thank you very much. Um, Holly, as always, will get a recap out, and we'll make sure we get that to you by tomorrow. And if you ever need anything, you know where I'm at. I'll get back to you as soon as possible with email, phone call, anything. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you very much. <laughs>